Hello, is this live and direct? Okay. <laughs> a network with a great future behind it. Um, so, um, the uh, e-meter is something of an infamous contraption, and to talk about it, I'd like to describe a couple of other contraptions first. Uh, on the left is a frog galvanoscope, which was invented in 1780 by Luigi Galvani when he discovered... <laughs> Yes, there's lots of science and some not science. Um, he discovered he could make the legs of dead frogs twitch by shocking them. Um, fortunately for the frogs, in 1820, Hans Christian Orsted discovered the relationship between electricity and magnetism, which led to the invention of the contraption on the right called a galvanometer. Now, the galvanometer works very simply. There's a coil of wire wound around a spindle, which is mounted inside a permanent magnet. And when you pass a current through the coil, um, this creates a magnetic field which works against the magnetic field of the permanent magnet and causes the spindle to rotate. Um, now, this is an important component uh, in a circuit at the heart of the E-meter called a Wheatstone bridge. Now, uh, strictly speaking, the resistance bridge was invented by Samuel Hunter Christie in 1833, but it's more closely associated uh, with Wheatstone because he improved upon it 10 years later. Now, um, the Wheatstone bridge is something, an example of something that I call teeter-totter technology. Um, now, if you can imagine uh, a seesaw, and above either end of the seesaw, there's a water pipe with water flowing out of them. Now, if the flow of water on both sides is equal, then the seesaw tends to stay level. And if you increase the flow on one side, then it will tilt to that side. Now, if you can, uh, further imagine that the galvanometer at the center of this network is the seesaw, and that the wires connected to it are the water pipes. And the utility of this circuit is that you can calculate uh, or measure the value of an unknown resistor, like the one on the lower right. Uh, and the way you do that is you adjust the variable resistor on the left uh, while keeping an eye on the needle of the galvanometer. And when the needle is in its idle position, you know that the currents on both sides of it are balanced, just like the equal flows of water from the water pipe. And kind of like measuring a weight on a balance scale, um, you can use the values of the three known resistances to calculate the value of the fourth. Math. Um, now, um, Wheatstone used this contraption to measure the conductivity of soil samples, but it wasn't long before somebody asked that most sciency of questions, what happens if we use this on people? <laughs> um, and it turned out that the resistance of living persons fluctuates. It's not quite constant. Uh, and for the reason why, we turn to French neurologist uh, Romain Vigourou, um, who in 1878 invented the electric vibrator. Um, <laughs> he is also credited with discovering that there was a neurological link to what is now called galvanic skin response, although he didn't quite figure out what the actual mechanism was. Uh, the mechanism that eluded Vigourou was shortly discovered by uh, two Swiss neurologists, Hermann and Luxinger, um, who found that it was due to sweat gland activity. And this kind of makes sense because uh, when there's more moisture in your skin, it makes it more conductive. Now, the sweat glands are controlled by the sympathetic nervous system, um, and it doesn't just make you sweat when you're hot, it also makes you sweat when you're nervous or anxious uh, or aroused. And uh, this proved to be very important because it meant that now you had a device which could, uh, in an oblique manner, uh, show you changes in a person's psychological state. And this was a great interest uh, to famed psychologist and man <laughs> who is most definitely judging you right now, Carl Gustav Jung. Now, Jung published a book in 1904 called Experiments, or rather, Studies in Word Association. Uh, and in that book, there was a, 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 a documented results of experiments conducted by Ludwig Binswanger, uh, who combined word association with galvanic skin measurements. Um, now, there was additional work on psychogalvanic devices in the early 20th century. Uh, with the exception of the polygraph, most of that happened in relative obscurity because it most wasn't that interesting to people outside of a laboratory. Uh, but that changed in the 1950s thanks to one man. Uh, and I am, of course, talking about Volney Matheson. Now, Matheson was born in 1897, and at the age of 16, he obtained a radio operator's license. Uh, and by 1918, he was working as a radio operator traveling along the western seaboard on ships. God damn it. Um, and he traveled as far north as British Columbia and Alaska. Um, by the 20s, he turned his hand to writing. 
Um, then got a job assembling shortwave radios in 1935 and later became a chiropractor and a psychoanalyst. Now, as a writer, his first novel was The Radio Buster, being some of the adventures of Samuel Jones, deep sea wireless operator in 1924. As you can see, it, it garnered a rather scathing review from the Maritime Radio Historical Society, which says, while contemptible as literature, it undoubtedly holds pride of place as the only novel written about the trials of a radio man at a fisheries station in Alaska. <laughs> he also contributed a number of short stories to various publications, including some Western-themed ones under the appropriately rustic pseudonym Dex Volney. Um, later in his career, he also wrote uh, Electropsychometry in 1952, How to Achieve Past Life Recalls in 1956, and The Secret Power of the Crystal Pendulum in 1958. Now, this may sound like an Indiana Jones fanfic, but it is not. Um, in Electropsychometry, he wrote that he first began considering the E-meter when he attended some lectures in 1950. This was almost certainly where he encountered uh, L. Ron Hubbard a man who needs no introduction, and I am not giving him one. <laughs> now, Hubbard produced some contemptible literature of his own. Um, <laughs> in 1950, he published Dianetics. Now, what is Dianetics? Well, <laughs> let me explain. No, it's too much, let me sum up. Um, <laughs> Hubbard posited the existence of something called mental mass, which was the idea that very stressful or traumatic experiences could have some residual effects on you beyond the scope of um, conscious memory. Uh, yeah, and um, these were cumulative and formed what he called the reactive mind. Now, Hubbard proposed treating these um, through uh, trying to re-stimulate and identify them with a complex series of examination techniques called auditing, which was supposed to allow the subject to confront these things and hopefully no longer be burdened by them. And um, Matheson's e-meter seemed to be perfect for this application, uh, and it was because of this that Matheson and Hubbard became pseudoscience bros. <laughs> now, here are two pages from the Journal of Scientology, published in 1953. The one on the right shows a complete kit featuring printed materials, uh, lecture tapes, and an e-meter uh, for the low, low price of $250 in cash. <laughs> now, I looked it up, and in 2018, that's equivalent to about $2,300, and that doesn't even account for the cost of a tape player. Now, um, due to some serious financial mismanagement, uh, Hubbard nearly lost control of his copyrights to Dianetics in the early 50s. This also led him to pivot from Dianetics to Scientology, but it made him very leery of something like that happening again. Um, well, in 1954, Matheson received a patent for the e-meter in his name only and refused to turn it over to Hubbard and Scientology. Uh, and this led to an end to their bromance. Um, in fact, the breakup was so bad that Hubbard banned the use of the e-meter in Scientology from 1955 through 1957. Um, now, uh, in 1958, he obtained a design for a slightly var a variation on the Matheson e-meter. He got a, a patent for that himself, and Scientology continues to use that similar contraption today. Now, at this point, um, there's one point I want to mention. Earlier, I said the, I mentioned the term mental mass, and uh, in another issue of the Journal of Scientology, uh, I found a reference that the Scientology e-meter is supposed to measure changes in your body's density, which seems to conflict with the idea of measuring changes in sweat glands. Um, and this leads to the question, is this what Scientologists actually believe? Um, and to prove that yes, they do, I want to read to you one paragraph very quickly from this book, uh, Understanding the E-meter, wherein Hubbard rather pointedly says the following. It has been discovered in Scientology that mental energy is simply a finer, higher level physical energy. The test of this is conclusive in that a thetan mocking up or creating mental image pictures and thrusting them into the body can increase the body mass and by casting them away again can decrease the body mass. This test has actually been made and an increase of as much as 30 pounds actually measured on scales has been added to and subtracted from a body by creating mental energy. Energy is energy. Matter is a condensation of energy. Now, 
This may have been inspired by the work of a more reputable scientist, uh, Albert Einstein, who showed that there was a relationship between matter and energy, but there are a few problems, to say the least, with Hubbard's interpretation. Uh, for one thing, in spite of his insistence, there is no documentation that he actually ever made such a test. There is no books, uh, no videos, no tapes, which is very peculiar because the one thing Scientology excels at is trying to sell people books and videos and tapes. Um, also, uh, there is um, there's a, 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 a one problem, which is the conflict between his idea and being able to measure the conductivity of sweat glands, and that is the e-meter can't really tell the difference between the two. All it can tell is how much current comes out of you once it puts some into you, and more than one thing can influence it. You need additional instrumentation, like a scale, to be able to figure out um, the difference between them. Uh, also, this is something that would be very easy to disprove if you just had a scale and a Scientology e-meter. Well, it happens I have a Scientology e-meter, uh, and it looks like this. And if you want, I will show it to you later. Um, now, its most prominent feature is that large um, uh, movement over on the um, left side, or sorry, the right side. Um, it is exceptionally springy. This is very important because the wiggles on the meter are actually what's important in Scientology. Uh, on the left, there's the large pointy knob that's called the tone arm. This refers to emotional tone, not musical notes. Um, and it controls the voltage on the cans of the e-meter, and I measured it with my digital multimeter, and it ranges from one to six volts, which tracks with the scale uh, along the dial. Now, the smaller pointy knob that's uh, below and to the right, that in conjunction with the uh, round knob all the way on the bottom left is a gain control for the amplifier that connects to the meter movement. Uh, the, the, the pointy one is a fine control and the uh, round knob is a coarse control. Um, the knob on the bottom middle, or yeah, the, the, the middle on the bottom is the on off switch and there's a battery test position. And then on the very right, there's a trim control to do a zero set. There are also two little displays. The one on top is just a clock and the one below that is what they call the tone arm counter, which counts how much you turn the tone arm down. Uh, there's this thing called taking tone off the preclear, so the voltage would decrease because maybe your skin becomes more conductive. Uh, and it only counts when you do that. If you turn it up again, it, it doesn't change. Um, this is something that the, the auditor has to keep track of while they're auditing you, so this is a, a bit of an aid. Um, during an auditing session, they give you the cans to hold, and a, the auditor, uh, will ask you questions or give you commands to try and elicit a response. The verbal responses you give may or may not actually matter, but be assured they will keep track of them anyway. Um, now, the, um, the auditor will look at the needle to see the types of movements that occur and the context in which they occur. And Hubbard went to great pains to document the different types of movements there are and created a shorthand notation for them. Uh, one side of the, ne the meter is marked rise and the other says fall. Uh, there are shortfalls, there are long falls, there are long falls with blowdown. Uh, there is a floating needle, which is a good thing. This what signals the end of any uh, Scientology process. There's a rock slam, which is a jerky movement. That's bad because it means you could be a potential trouble source. Uh, and then there's a very short, very rapid movement back and forth, which is called a theta bop. <laughs> that indicates your theta being is rapidly entering and leaving your body. Um, now, I also took a picture of the inside of this, and it looks like this. This is a Mark VI electropsychometer. It's uh, from the 70s. That large chip that's uh, over on the left is the clock chip, and uh, there's some discrete logic that goes along with it. Now, this is the Mark VII electropsychometer. Um, this one has Intel inside. <laughs> I am not kidding. It has an Intel 8051 uh, microcontroller, and the reason they did that is because they wanted to be able to train other uh, uh, Scientologist in auditing. Um, and so uh, this device can sample the position of the tone arm and the tone arm counter. Uh, and that extra display that it has is um, the tone arm position and also the position of the needle. And it transmits that to a remote device so people can monitor uh, what's going on. It also allows um, the connection of a remote tone arm, which is what's shown over here on the right. Now, auditing has um, one little problem it is slightly biased in favor of right handed persons because you have to put your thumb on the tone arm knob and manipulate it very carefully without the pre-clear noticing and then write things down with your right hand. Now, if you're left-handed and you have to write with your left, then when you put your hand across the meter, you kind of obscure your view. And so they actually have a left-handed version of the Mark 7 e meter They think of everything. Um, now, this is not the last model. The final one is the Mark 8, which looks like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
The card reader is obviously a joke, but that is actually what the Mark 8 e meter looks like. Um, it is a little bit uh, more advanced. The design for it was started in the early 2000s, and it came into use probably in the last five years or so. Uh, it has the ability to store the various meter uh, movement data and then to recover it later on a computer for, to study it offline. Um, now, in closing, um, I need to give a toast. And I had a little trouble deciding who I was going to toast. Um, and so I decided those who were deserving the most of recognition were the frogs. <laughs> those poor, poor frogs. Because if it hadn't been for their sacrifices, we could not have made such great technological leaps. <laughs> to the frogs. Wow, thank you, Bill. That was, that was something. I wonder if the only reason why they had a clock on the device is so you could figure out how much time you've wasted on Dianetics. <laughs> and time is money, obviously. The bill. Oh, the billing. I see what you did there. That was good. All right. We are just about at our intermission. You can go over and tell the bartenders how much you enjoy their work. But we are building an Adventure Harvey map. So if you can go over to our merch table and buy one of the super, super, super cute, adorable, awesome, you must have one right now, Harvey's, um, you can hashtag your photos so we can find them and we'll put them in the Something Weird group. So you can either put them on Facebook or Instagram. And, uh, you know, I guess it's a good question to ask, where has Harvey been recently? Where has Harvey been recently? <laughs> Harvey's been to the Arctic Circle. He's been a very small subject in the big state of Alaska. He went to Comic-Con, yay! And then Harvey went drinking in England, and the really sad thing, and I saw this on Instagram and I had to put it in, is that someone lost him. So don't forget to take your Harvey home. But I hear we sell more if you want one. All right, one more thing. We rely on your support to make this crazy thing happen. During intermission, you can get discount tickets to our next show, Custom Odd Salon Glassware. Pretty. Pretty. Advanced, uh, like I said, advanced discount tickets for upcoming salons, buttons, stickers, and a whole lot more. So, there's Harvey. We're going to take a short cocktail break. Don't go anywhere. we got three more stories for you, including explorations of the secret contraptions. Wait, I changed this around. I'm sorry. We're going to talk about the panic-inducing contraptions of astronomy and the reasons behind random kosher wires in your city. And we're going to give away a Harvey, so make sure you fill out a raffle ticket to win. Have a good break, and we'll see you in a bit. <laughs>